I, what I wanted to talk about and, and about secularism and I, I've had a lot of arguments with people about what people think secularism is um, and, uh, and we were talking that one person actually said to me, he said secular society, uh, it's, it's a bad society, secular, uh, we can see this in the West, we can see how the secular society has failed and, and I thought well, well one, I, we're not an entirely secular society and, and two, if you are worried going well look what happened once this secularism kicked in you know, because it used to be so much better in the old days. Now, if you think it was better in the old days, then look at the child mortality rates in 1941. Look at, read in fact, Robert Roberts' excellent book, um, The Classic Slum, where you will see how a delightful religious society turned its back on anyone who was considered to be the underclass or not worthy of them. Um, we have a fantastic way of rewriting history all the time. And, and to me, one of the greatest battles that we have as human beings, as people who want a civilization, is, it's not obviously secularism, that's not what the battle is against. It's not actually religion that the battle, I think, is against. The battle is against thoughtlessness. I think what all of us have here is this incredible thing, as you, you probably all know. Inside every single one of your skulls is the most complex thing in the known universe. We are able, and we have every single one of us, this is a beautiful and fantastic thing. We have minds. We have minds which are so complex, the number of neurons, is, if you've ever looked at that number, it's one of those moments where you go, I've lost my breath for a second. That's just in my skull, that seems like a ridiculous thing. And with those things, we can think. We don't need to have this battle where we go, well, do you know what, I, I just need someone to tell me what to do. I need a leader. When someone turned to me and I, I, go, I, I don't do it anymore. I used to call these terrible radio and television shows as the token atheist to, you know, kind of eventually shout at Stephen Green from Christian Voice in a pointless <laughs> manner. Um, I would always have this same thing said to me. People would say, how can you have morality if there's no God? Now, to consider that we as human beings would require a fear of punishment and some great big figure watching over us to behave well. Peter Hitchens, the popular right-wing broadcaster who spends much of his time saying that the BBC is a terrible left-wing organisation when he's not continually on the BBC. Um, he actually said this, he said, um, I would worry about what I would do if I didn't believe in God. I would worry how I would behave. Now that says far more about him, I think, as a human being and the depravity that may lie within than about human beings. I hope that everyone gathered here knows that we, the responsibility that we have as human beings, that the, when someone said, how can you have morality if there's no God? I thought, you know, it's a bit early to judge the atheists on how we're doing. Because, I, I mean, I think we, we do all right, generally. I'm, I'm not, or some of you may well not be atheists. It's a secular meeting after all. But I think, you know, overall, I, I, I haven't been using a God. I've been using a gut instinct. It's been working, generally. You know, every, every, occasionally I do pick up the knife and I go towards the old lady. <laughs> and I always pop it down before I get there. You know, the gut instinct kicks up. What am I doing, I think? And that, that to me, is, is one of the things where, where, where we're told, how can you have morality without God? I think, do you know what? The bigger question is, how can there have been so little morality in certain organisations when they've had God? To have... <laughs> when I was arguing... I was arguing with a cat a Catholic man who said, how can you have morality without God? And I said, you know what? I would turn to your own house before you say that. Because there is one of the dangers, and I'm not, I'm not going to bang on about Catholicism, but where we have moments where we have people that we believe are our superiors, when we lose the, uh, ourselves, we go, I've been told to do that, so I must do that. And this is what happened when we see, unfortunately, what happened with the Catholic Church was certain people had a level of power that meant other people were in fear of them. And they believed they must do whatever those people said. And that is what happens when we subjugate ourselves. That's one of the most important things about being human beings, is to take responsibility for ourselves, to be prepared to argue against other people, even though they may well have epaulets and fine high hats. We must sometimes go, no, that is wrong. And when people are fearful of turning against anyone who they believe is their leader, that is the terrifying moment. Um, there is also another thing, that, by the way, I don't know why I bothered writing a speech, I'll never get around to looking at it, as anyone who's ever seen me before, by the way, you may well be here for three hours. Um, I've told the police to come on once we've gone over time. Um, but this is the thing where I, I did, another one, I was arguing recently, I briefly mentioned faith schools, I was arguing with a friend of mine who's a Muslim, and he was saying, he was saying, I think faith schools are very, very important. He said, I don't think they're about indoctrination. He said, um, you know, it, it's important, he said, as a Muslim. I said, but you spend so much of your time telling me 
that no one understands Muslims. He's a very liberal Muslim, and he, he said, yes, a lot of people don't understand the Quran. And I said, you're saying people don't understand you, and what you're also wanting to do is bring in a segregated school system. You are wanting to make sure, so here we go, the Muslims go to the Muslim school, and the Jewish children go to the Jewish school, and the Catholic, and this to me is, it, it, never mind about the ideas and the fear of indoctrination, intelligent design, etc. To me, the greatest enemy of bigotry is when you're actually mixing with the people that other people are trying to make you bigoted against. If you know people, if you know kind and decent Muslims, you know kind and decent Jews, you know people who are gay and you go, do you know what? They're not like I was told in the newspapers. They seem all right, actually. The many of them had two whole hands and everything, right? This is... This is another battle we have as well, this is the battle for sectarism, is to get the message across that it is not. I, I find it incredible that some people seem to believe that actually equal rights is somehow a bigotry. Oh, the bigoted nature of everyone being equal. How un we actually, I saw someone recently say, a lot of people are talking about racism. Has anyone thought about the fact that racists, racists themselves are oppressed now? They are not free to say. We, this is how much the language has been spun round in an Orwellian fashion. Now, let us think for a moment about the racists. Some of them are no longer allowed to daub their things on a wall. And I think if we can get out there and we can beat the media, because sometimes this is one of the battles, is the media is trying to make out that sectorism is some kind of crushing thing. There's something which is going to... You know, I know Christians who think, you know, oh, do you want to close the churches? No! Did you know what? I, I very rarely see a sectorist or an atheist with a placard outside a church on a Sunday. I've seen people with placards outside Jerry Springer the Opera. I've seen people with placards outside plays and musicals which have criticised religion. But I've never seen people who don't have religion go, you can't go to church. You're fine. It gives us an hour where we have a lot more space. We're happy for it. More of you go in there. Um, I will. Uh, I, I know. There is, I'm, I'm going to end on something which is. I, I just think this is. I genuinely think. When anything, it's like often you'll get. Obviously, also there are things about. Oh, if you don't believe in God, what about what about Stalin? And to me, the battle is not against religion. Right? It is not against religion. Um, I, I, I know lots of people of faith who uh, many of the things that they believe in, the majority of things they believe in, are things for a good society. And we always have to remember that as well, that we often see the worst. It's like most evolutionary biologists I know think that all Christians are mad, right? I'm not just talking about Richard Dawkins, there are others I've heard, right? And, and I realise why, I realise that because they, the worst, they see the worst side of, of people with faith. They just get constant mad letters saying, there's no transitional fossils. They go, yes, there are. No, there aren't. Look, there's loads over there. I can't see them. Turn around. No, I won't. I want to win. Right? And this is the thing, you know, so they see the worst of it. And I think sometimes in the media we see the worst. And if we can get out there and we can explain to people, this is about everyone having freedom to be the people they want to be. But it is not about saying to people that you are actually superior. This is what we had in society not that long ago, and in, as has been mentioned already, in many societies this happens, where there are tiered levels. There should not be tiered levels in what we are as human beings. We are all human beings. It doesn't matter what your sexuality is, what your race is, what your belief is. We are all on the same level playing field. No one is better than one other person because they've got a better book, a better belief, or a better way of having sex. None of those things make anyone better. So... Um, someone the other day, I spent a lot of my time arguing, I'm sure you all do, um, <laughs> where someone actually said to me, they said, but gay marriage debases marriage, and I still can't get my head around this, right, because I, I am a married person, and I can't work out how, this was someone from Christian Concern, again, one of those kind of organisations which I don't think really represents Christians in this country, but they get on the media a bit too much. Afterwards, by the way, if you want me to tell you a story about Stephen Green, which I can't tell you due to the swear words involved in it, I'm very happy to share that with you uh, about what three people at Greenbelt Christian Festival thought he was like, and they were Methodists. So, <laughs> but this is the gay marriage. Again, it's just about, it, when you actually look at something going, I'm not, when you're reading a, a book of science, you don't put it down and you immediately go, ah, this is true. You look at it and you start to think, could that be true? If you're reading about the wonderful work of Charles Darwin, when you read Charles Darwin's work, you know you can go out afterwards and you can go into the parks and you can look at the sky and you can see creatures scampering around and you can start to think about why they evolved in that way and you can question yourself. This is wonderful things. With all of the books that we have, with all the information we have, we have to keep questioning. Why? Why do I believe this? The, the worst thing to ever have is 100% truth. 
Once you have 100% truth, that way much trouble lies. Once you know you are ultimately right and nothing will ever change that, that is where the danger is. And with gay marriage, when, when someone said, but how is my marriage debased? The only thing that debases my marriage is if I treat my partner badly, if I debase my own marriage. If, if, if two men get married, or two women get married, what do I do now? Oh, it's a bit embarrassing now some men have married. If I tell anyone I'm married, they'll think I'm gay. You know, it just it doesn't make any sense. Marriage is already debased. And, you know, if you want to see marriage debased, I, I find it debased because sometimes I see people marrying that I don't like very much. I saw an awful woman marry a ghastly man last year. In many ways, that debased my marriage. The awful and the ghastly are marrying. Never mind people of the same sex. So, I just think, I, I'm going to end on something that I've read many times before, and it's just something which I think sums up the importance of the way we think. I was going to read a bit of Feynman, by the way. If you ever get a chance, read Richard Feynman on the nature of epaulets and the Pope. It's a wonderful thing. Um, but uh, I, I think we have to remember that we are such complex creatures. And you know all these things that I'm saying to you, but it's just the, the, the wonder that we have, the perpetual question, the fact... And we have to also defend this other thing as well, that we live in an evidence-based world. I think, you know, we can accept people's mystical beliefs, that's fine, but they are not superior to the evidence-based things that we are striving for. The fact that all of you people here are gathered here now, if we went back a hundred years, the majority of you would be dead by the age of, you would not have made it this way. And you haven't survived this far because your mum and dad sacrificed the best goat they had. You have survived because of evidence-based thinking. Right? And that, to me, is something we always have to remember as well. That, in the end, wherever evidence can be used in an argument, it must be used. That is what has built this society and everything within it. Um, the final thing that I wanted to read is... Uh, Do you know what, I forget sometimes how passionately I believe these things, and then I start talking about God, they really do mean a lot to me. And, um, this is something I've read so many times, and when, the, when I first saw it spoken by a man who is my hero, and many of you will know his work, uh, it, it is a piece of work by Carl Sagan. I was thinking that, as, as we know, uh, Voyager is, is currently battling to leave our solar system at this point, uh, and there was a very famous photo taken, uh, it was taken from Saturn uh, by Voyager, and the image uh, is known as the pale blue dot. And the pale blue dot is this fantastic image that even from Saturn, even within our own solar system, the Earth is just a tiny dot. And Carl Sagan saw this was actually his idea to take a photo from Saturn of the planet Earth. And he mused on this, he wrote a whole book called Pale Blue Dot, and this to me is one of the most important bits when we think about secular thinking, when we think about the importance of trying to avoid irrationalism and where sometimes mysticism can take us. I think all of this is held within these three paragraphs. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who has ever lived out their lives, lived it here. The abode of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, Every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer. Every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. As we know from what we found out about the universe so far, there may be a lot of life out there, but currently life appears to be a very, very fragile thing. And the idea of the variety of life that we see around us every single day, just in this one moment when you look around at the people who are here and the trees are over there, means it is something that is very, very important to preserve. And I genuinely believe that using free thinking and using secular ideas is the best way of trying to create the best society and a proper civilization. Thank you very much. Good luck to you.